He was basketball's first truly athletic big man. His astonishing vertical leap allowed him to rebound and block shots with an almost laughable dominance. He perfected the outlet pass, triggering the legendary Boston fast break. Over 13 years in the NBA, he won 11 championships, making him the greatest winner in the history of professional sports. Four seconds left, and the lead is down to two points. All right, Casey with the ball. Gets surrounded. One second. That's it. It's all over. After winning a record eight straight NBA championships, the Boston Celtics faced a major chemical change in 1966 when Red Arback retired as head coach. So I said to Russell, who's going to coach the team? And he said, uh, Alex Hannum. And I said, how can you let Alex Hannum coach you? I said, he's the only guy in, in basketball that you ever punched out. And I said, for crying a lot, I said, this team is 12 jocks drafts of basketball and Bill Russell. I said, you're the franchise. You should be the coach. And so exactly 19 years after baseball's color barrier was broken, Bill Russell became the first black head coach of a major American professional sport. Brad, any final words of advice to the new coach? Wish! Russell was the winningest person I've ever been around would do superhuman things when they needed it to be done. Russell didn't know how to lose. Honest to God, did not know how to lose. Indeed, in 22 winner-take-all games, including the 1956 Olympics, NBA playoffs, and NCAA tournaments, Russell's teams were 22-0. There was something in his eyes. He would glower in such a way to inspire confidence in his teammates and fear among his opponents. The whole game for Bill Russell was a psychological event. He was always testing you. Bill Russell would be introduced, and he would walk out, and he would fold his arms like a Watusi chieftain. This is Mr. Bill Russell. We're here for serious business. Russell won with intelligence, an intimidating court presence, and an innovative form of denial that foreshadowed the modern game. He not only controlled the damn backboard completely, but he revolutionized the uh, the defensive game. Driving the lane, he lays it up as He made shot blocking an art and proved that quickness and finesse and brains was a match for Braun. He had great timing, great quickness. If you didn't see him driving to the hoop, you know he was going to be there somewhere. I can't tell you how many layups were missed by individuals that heard footsteps behind him thinking it was Bill Russell swooping in. Psychologically, he knew when you were tired, and he'd watch you bend down and hold your shorts, and he'd whisper something to you like, getting to you, isn't it? It's pretty hot in here, isn't it? Russell's leadership was rooted in his selflessness. Victory, not baskets, filled him up. The loyalty he engendered found expression in the seventh game of the 1965 Eastern Division Final. Something like four seconds left in the game. We inbound the ball. We win the game. Knock uh, Philadelphia and uh, Wilt out of the playoffs and move on to the finals. Bill Russell took the ball to throw it inbounds. And we were all pressing on him. Russell throws the ball. All of a sudden, the ball goes straight down. He loses the ball off the support. The ball hits a wire that connects the basket to the balcony. And the ball goes to Philadelphia with five seconds. Russell walks into the huddle, and he says, Boy, did I screw up. Somebody get me off the hook. If the chemistry wasn't exactly right, everybody would have said, Well, you're getting the most money. You're getting the most publicity. Get yourself off the hook. Greer is putting the ball on a play. He gets it out deep, and Havlicek steals it over the San Jose. Havlicek stole the ball. It's all over. He had helped us out so many times, and we believed in him so much. There was a communion of spirit and a belief in each other. It's all over. Russell was the anvil upon which Arbach hammered out the famous Celtic character. Sometimes it required that he spill his guts. One day we're playing a playoff game, and I said, okay, let's go out and get the job done. And all of a sudden, I realized Russell didn't vomit. So I called the team back. I got him back in the dressing room. I said, all right, sit down. I paced up and back for about 10 seconds. I said, Russell, go vomit. Everybody looked. He got up, went to the, <laughs> to the head there and vomited. We came back and we won. Admired for his intensity in the locker room, Russell often displayed an abrasive attitude towards the public and the press. 
he really wasn't very friendly. If you didn't know him, you'd probably say, like, man, he's the nastiest guy in the world. He was he didn't smile a lot. He was serious. He gave short answers. If you ask him a question, he felt it was a dumb question. He didn't answer. And you do the job impartially without any racial prejudice in reverse. Yes. Bill Russell, one of the really terrible guys I ever encountered in sports. He was just not a day at the beach. Surly, rude. He was a pain in the ass. How do you feel about going into another seventh game, uh, this time on somebody else's floor? I've done it before. He held so many people at arm's length that the truth of the matter was that Bill Russell would not have been beloved anywhere. And I suspect it didn't matter to him because he didn't do anything to court that. In your new role as coach, are you going to be a, a little more public relations conscious than you were as a player? No. He's always been uh, a private man and will always be a private man. He listens to a different voice. He listens to his own voice. Bill's a guy who, who won two NCAA championships, won an Olympic gold medal, and won, what, 11 rings? You know, when you do that, I don't think you need to worry about going outside and have the public affirm that you're pretty good. When you come to write the story about Bill Russell, and everything that he has done. It can be encapsulated in one word, and that is defensive. Everything about him, everything about his personality, everything about the way he played basketball, spoke to being defensive. Born in Monroe, Louisiana in 1934, William Felton Russell was imbued with a strong family tradition of standing up to the white man. The times hadn't changed since Bill's grandfather held off the Klan one night with a shotgun. When you grow up in Louisiana and there's a mob and somebody's going to kick your daddy's ass or lynch him, you know, if you don't get out the house and your daddy makes it, we're not getting out the house. You know, that's it. They're just going to have to kill us. That was growing up in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and Georgia. It was life and death stuff. No longer willing to tolerate a white-dominated society, Charlie Russell moved his family west, settling in Oakland, California. Three years later, Bill's mother died of a virus at just 32. I think that emotional crisis of losing his mother probably set the tone for Russell. That was a family with its center gone, um, migrating beyond the known world. Even in high school, I think he was a little shy. He may have been because he was a tall, gangly type, didn't get invited to dances. He was just as much of a mystery person as he is now. With his six foot two inch frame, Bill caught the attention of basketball coach George Poles, who created a 16th spot on a 15 man junior varsity roster. During the summer, Poles sponsored him on a boys club team. The area we were in, it was a very narrow line between okay and going the wrong way. My choice to give Bill money out of his pocket to go to play in the boys club, what he was saying there is, Bill, I want you to go work on your skills so it will help you, help you to be a better basketball player, help you to be a better person. Russell overcame his awkwardness and led McClyman's High School to the Oakland City Championship in his senior year. I went to see George Poles. I said, uh, maybe I'm dreaming, but I honestly think this kid, if we could train him, teach him, could be great. We met that summer in, uh, in the coach's office, and we were introduced. And he looks down, and I look up, and Nice to meet you. Uh, right away, I'm intimidated by his height. I've never been around a guy that tall. At six, nine and a half, Russell led San Francisco to a record 55 straight victories and back-to-back -back NCAA titles before leading the U.S. basketball team to a gold medal in 1956. When I was working for Time and Sports Illustrated, we just constantly sent memos back to New York saying you should think of putting this guy from San Francisco on the cover. And they'd come back and say, yeah, but we, we got the box score last night. He got six points. And we'd say, yeah, but did you notice the other team only got 42? Straight from Melbourne, he arrived in December and took the Celtics to their first NBA title. As the foundation of the Celtics dynasty, he should have been received as a favorite son. But Russell was never embraced by a city ethnically divided. 
As a kid growing up then, he was never your hero. You knew what a great player he was, and you knew you wanted him on your team, but you wanted to be the Coos. I knew nobody that said they wanted to be Bill Russell. Bill Russell was the first black athlete in Boston of any prominence, and Bob Cousy was getting all the headlines. So Red became the spreader of the gospel. Red Auerbach became Bill Russell's John the Baptist. But Auerbach could not protect Russell and the other black Celtics from the prevailing social attitudes. In some cities, we would hear racist crap walking through the stands. You'd have to walk through in some cities to get to the floor. Marion, Indiana presented the Celtics with the key to the city. And then we tried to go across the street to a restaurant. We walk in, there are a lot of chairs there, uh, tables empty. And we were met by someone who said, uh, may we help you? And then, yes, we'd like to have something to eat. She said, I'm sorry, but everything's reserved here. And we said, all these chairs? <laughs> Russell went back to his room, got the key to the city, went over to the mayor's house, knocked a bang on his door and gave him back his key, told him what he could do with his key. We benefited from that anger and that intensity because the game would start and everyone with another shirt was whitey and he'd do it to them. In 1962, Russell moved his family to Reading, Massachusetts, a predominantly white suburb of Boston. Why did Russell live in Reading? Because he was a black man and he was going to take black people to Reading and show them that black people could live in Reading, just like ordinary people. And the town threw a big party for him. And he got up and spoke and he said, this is where I want to spend the rest of my life. And he started to cry. He went to buy a new house. They started circulating petitions against him in the neighborhood. When he finally did get a home, they broke in and wrote all sorts of racial slurs on the walls. Someone smashed all of his trophies. They, they defecated in my parents' bed. Robbed his house and left terrible signs there about the fact they didn't want a black family living in Reading. He felt betrayed. He wore his heart on his sleeve for certain incidents, but he'd never show the people that again. I think that he was in hell in Boston, to the point that Russell said, I didn't play for Boston. I played for the Celtics. I should have been much more sensitive to Russell's anguish. We talk uh, <laughs> By 1960, Russell had been to Africa and touched his roots. Three years later, he went to Mississippi after Medgar Evers had been murdered and conducted a basketball clinic in Jackson, the belly of the beast. He was an extraordinarily brave guy. A lot of people told him he couldn't go to the funeral, that he would be shot at, too. A reporter was asking him, why are you coming down here? Russell said, unwavering, I'll do anything I can do to help. Seeing him out of the uniform in Mississippi, when they're catching hell down there, they're killing people, and here is the greatest center of all time. And I'd never seen a black athlete in that context. I just remember thinking, that's why that guy is so good, because that guy's got commitment. Young people saw in Bill Russell exactly what they were looking for, a proud, strong, black athlete who would stand up there and be very, very smart and uncompromising in what he said. I think they found in Bill Russell the antidote for racism. In an era when most black athletes chose to be silent, Russell stood to his full height, charging the NBA with racial quotas while pushing for the first black referee. Russell was one of the first uh, so-called Negroes that I ever met in my life who called himself black when it was not fashionable, when it was insulting to be called black. He walked around town for years with, the, with a cape. Why? Well, he thought it was cool, and he knew it would, would just make people react. The goatee was a phenomenally hostile statement for the average white person. He was not out there to make white people feel good about themselves. He said, take me as I am or don't take me at all. Are you saying then that there are white people who will never accept Negro people? Is that what you mean? Sure, there are Negro people that will never accept white people. Bill Russell was not anti-white, but anybody who did not respect him, black, white, or otherwise, he would drop you like a sack of rotten potatoes. Russ, in my judgment, used to go through this Jekyll and Hyde transformation. When he was in the unit, he was incredibly outgoing, 
very clever in terms of, of, of humor. Now, listen, we're close, but we're not funny. <laughs> he had a laugh that would blow the roof off a building at times. He enjoyed the camaraderie of the team. I mean, we were all like brothers. And all of a sudden, he'd step outside that unit, get into a train station, a plane, terminal, a, uh, a hotel, and wow, boy, the mask would come down. You've always thought that perhaps uh, autographs were a little foolish, didn't you? Yeah, they still, I still think they're a waste of time. Kids would come up to him and they'd say, uh, Mr. Russell, I think an autograph, he'd say, son, I don't give autographs, I, but I'd be happy to shake your hand. He just really believed that you took him at the value as the man, and that a handshake was a lot better than a signature. He would not sign an autograph for his teammates. Einstein almost got in a fight with him in New York because, you know, Tommy felt embarrassed. He had family people there. Tommy's from Jersey. They're hovering around the locker room, and Tommy needs to get something signed because all the other teammates have signed it, and Russell won't do it. Tom Sanders is, is taking a, a picture around or something, trying to get everybody on the team to sign it. And everybody signs it, high satch, best, you know, love being, you know, all that, like a high school yearbook gets to Russell, and Russell won't sign it. Sanders says, I'm not some kid in the street. I'm your teammate. And Russell goes exactly the opposite direction. He says, Satch, you know me. You of all people shouldn't be presenting this to me. Russell insisted there was no value in autographs. But if others thought they were worth something and were willing to pay, he was willing to sign. In 1992, he inked a $2 million seven-year contract to sign autographs for a collectibles firm. My idea is that my dad's also no dummy when it comes to business, and I think, you know, they're like, there's just so much money <laughs> here. In that context, it's very much his job at that moment to do this task. Autographs changed. Autographs became valuable. They weren't valuable at one point. And so I think you can almost say that professionally he will sign autographs, Casually, he won't. And I, I do think that it's difficult in some respects to resolve that, but I think it's fair. When we return, the wars of Russell and Chamberlain and a bittersweet homecoming for a man who said he'd never return. Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes is presented by GMC. Do one thing, do it well. Also brought to you by Nike, by Wheaties, the breakfast of champions, and by MCI, five cents every day. I think in the long run, I'll be able to handle myself man to man with almost anyone in the league. The first time we played Wilt, Wilt destroyed Bill Russell. Put enough fear in Bill Russell's heart that Russell refocused and refocused and refocused every time we played them. So you got the extreme best out of Russell. That is what elevated the competition, is that every night they had to prove something to each other. Man, we don't even need to be out here. They're playing in rarefied air. Their battles are legend. In eight NBA playoffs, Chamberlain's team won only once. In 143 games, Russell won 86 to Wilt's 57. In sports, they always say that Will overcome skill and I think that when you have that kind of clash of titans it's the will and the mind of Russell that will always dominate he wanted it more it wasn't a matter of Wilt versus Russell with Bill he would let Wilt score 50 if we want and the thing that was most important to him was you know championships rings and winning when Wilt became the NBA's first $100,000 player, Arbach up Russell's contract to $100,001. The Boston Celtics have done it again. The last game symbolized the Russell legend. As player coach, he led his team from a fourth place regular season finish to the NBA title. Then, the long, sometimes lonely, run was over. Oh, Russell, Bill, this must have been a great win for you. Exactly. When Russell retired, he was saluted as the greatest of them all at the time, but there was never a feeling of warmth. It was nothing like when Cousy retired and people were sobbing and the guys yelling out, we love you, Cousy. It was nothing like Bird getting a night one year after he retired. March 12, 1972, Bill Russell's number was raised. And during the game, an announcement was made to the crowd and they gave him a great ovation and he didn't acknowledge it and it antagonized a lot of people. The cold silence lasted 27 years. 
And when he was finally ready to have his number raised, Boston's initial response was predictable. Boston's famous for payback. It's all about politics and payback, and this was payback. You know, for all these years that you said uh, you didn't like Boston, for all these years you said Boston was, was uh, uh, not a good place to play and not a good place to live, now you want to come back and, and have us buy tickets to watch your uniform, but we're not going to do it. Facing the prospects of thousands of empty seats in the Fleet Center, Russell had to conduct a personal media blitz. In the end, 12,000 fans, friends, and former players showed up to honor number six. I thank you for this. It's very humbling. But... He's 65 years old, and he has softened to the degree that I think he was finally willing to allow people in Boston to honor him. However he thought about the city of Boston, his experience as a Boston Celtic was the most important thing in his life. When he passes away, he's not sure if he's going to be able to go to heaven because heaven for him was playing for the Boston Celtics with those guys. What I wanted to thank you for is letting me come into your life. When I was on a college campus up at UMass, he had just given a speech and he had to drive back to Boston from Amherst and he spent four hours with me. I said, if I can touch somebody's life like that, one-on-one, -on -one, in my lifetime, I'm gonna feel as though a debt has been repaid. The, the folks that came to the garden and the fans, you were part of my life. We went up to Oakland together. I mean, we really spent an awful lot of time together, the kind of time that writers and athletes don't usually get. And as we were going to the airport, we come to a red light. And Bill turns to me and he says, um, I'm sorry that we can't be friends. I said, Bill, I thought we were friends. He said, no, we can be acquaintances. We can be friendly. But Frank, we can't be friends. He said, I think that you really have to work if you're going to be friends. And I was just so touched by the fact that somebody put so much thought into what constituted friendship. He's a great man, this guy. Great emotional things, smart, tough. Uh, but the people here didn't understand this man, and they belittled him when he shouldn't have been. When people referred to him as a basketball player, he, he, he almost resented that. His position was always, I'm a total human being, I'm a man who, among other things, plays a great game of basketball. For those close to Bill, they see an infectious personality, a deep sense of humor, a strong intellect, and a fierce social conscience. To those shut out by Russell's wall, he seems distant, detached, and uncompromising. The question is, will we ever get to see Bill the way his family and friends do? For Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes, I'm Dan Patrick. This has been a presentation of ESPN the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, a part of the Go Network. Go.